Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, we are dealing here with a global problem, but can it be solved on a regional level? Definitely not on a national one, that's for sure. We talk internationally, we talk regionally, and therefore we are very proud to have today the president of the Euro European Commission, uh, Manuel Barroso. Welcome. Morning. Chancellor Feynman, Governor Schwarzenegger, Director General Jim Keller, Prime Minister Ponta, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Chancellor Feynman already set out many of the challenges which our planet faces at the intersection of our energy needs and climate protection. Challenges which we must work together to overcome for the benefit of our and future generations. And let me, dear Werner, congratulate you, not only for your energetic speech, but also for the leadership Austria and yourself are showing in this very important priority for the European Union. Indeed, we have no time to lose. We are rapidly approaching the threshold of an increase of two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures. The effects of this are already being seen around the world, sometimes in an obvious catastrophic manner, but also less visibly as incremental changes impact on our daily lives. We need to work together, certainly, because the challenges we face from atmospheric warming to energy insecurity simply know no borders. But also because tackling these issues means going beyond traditional economic thinking and traditional political methods. Here is the importance of this R20 conference to act as a catalyst for innovative thinking and new solutions and real action in the ground. I therefore applaud Governor Schwarzenegger for his vision to create the R20 initiative, which builds such diverse and strong alliances for climate action and sustainability, and this in the United States and also internationally. Thank you for your initiative. Economically, we cannot deal with the challenges of the 21st century with a growth model from the 19th and the 20th century. And also politically, it is important that new approaches are explored across the board. Regions 20 is a charming example of this new mindset in business and in government at regional level because it draws on so many stakeholders and their expertise in many respects. The work of R20 is similar to that of the European Union, as it connects different actors on all levels to cooperate on common challenges, to be stronger together. Within the European Union, this has been our successful working method of more than half a century. But we too have evolved. Sustainability is new as an issue, and it is now deeply ingrained in all our policies. The European Union leadership on energy and climate matters is based on our ambitious climate and energy package up to 2020. I'm proud that the initiative of the European Commission during my first mandate was approved unanimously by our member states and is now a global reference point. This policy framework is based on three headline targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions, minus 20%, renewable energy reaching a share of 20%, and energy savings of also 20%. We are well on our way to achieving these targets. Furthermore, climate and energy policies stand at the heart of the European 2020 growth agenda. This agenda has also been agreed unanimously by our member states. It sets out our clear united commitment to ensuring long-term smart, inclusive, and above all, sustainable growth in Europe. As importantly, we have mainstreamed this thinking into the external actions of the European Union, from climate negotiations per se, to the greening of our international aid, 
which we provide as the world's most generous donor. 2012 saw two landmark international conferences, the, the Rio Plus 20 Summit and the Doha Conference on Climate Change. In both, we did not unfortunately achieve all that we wanted, but we have set out a detailed and operational agenda for the future, so I believe some progress is being made. Not enough, but some progress is being made. And this is particularly the case for Rio Plus 20, which confirmed our common vision of an economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable future for the planet for present and future generations. More specifically, the concept of Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, the principle of which was agreed in Rio de Janeiro, will be a valuable tool for the future if implemented correctly. The European Union is currently working hard to flesh out these SDGs in more detail and fit them into our broader global development agenda. And this is not just good intentions. We are committing the resources to make our political will a reality. The European Commission has earmarked almost 2 billion euro for projects related to the Rio outcome for 2012 and 2013, with a total of around 8 billion euro for sustainable development in general. Climate action and sustainable development are two phases of the same kind. Global warming undermines development opportunities and exacerbates poverty, notably in most vulnerable countries, and ultimately becomes the major security issue as a risk multiplier for food scarcity, migration, and regional instability. This is why we will vigorously pursue the post-Doha climate agenda too, towards a comprehensive global climate treaty that should be agreed by 2015 and enforced by 2020. In all of this, you who work at the subnational level have a vital role to play. Your actions, for example, R20's low carbon projects bring global initiatives closer to the people, to the citizens, demonstrating that sustainability is not just short-term pain for long-term gain, but can also bring clear benefits to people's day-to-day -day lives here and now. And this daily buy-in is vital for sustainability to succeed. Of course, the current economic situation makes it difficult to find the resources for some projects. The European Commission recognized this, and we are therefore reorienting our regional policy to ensure more focused support on actions which support smart, sustainable growth and jobs. And let me give one e local example. The European Commission is providing 5.6 million euro to support what is known as the Green Building Cluster in Lower Austria. The regional government is working with 200 partners, not just on research and innovation, but on concrete actions such as renovating and improving the energy efficiency of old buildings, thereby creating smart, sustainable growth and real jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, this last example shows one thing in particular. The key to the future is forging deeper partnerships between all actors at every level. Global, national, regional, and local governments, certainly. But we must also work even more closely with the business sector. I have spoken about the need for a new mindset. This applies to us all, including business, and particularly to how business interacts with governments and citizens. There is a clear business case for green investing. The terms green and growth are not in contradiction. Building a low-carbon economy is essential to prevent climate change from reaching dangerous levels. It is also a huge opportunity to boost prosperity and get us out of the current crisis. And let me give you briefly a few examples. The global market for green technologies is worth 1,000 billion euros per year and expected to double or even triple by 2020. In Europe alone, just over the last five years, more than 300,000 new jobs were already created in the renewable sector. And it is estimated that fully meeting the European Union's 2020 climate and energy goals, which I just sketched, would result in another 1.5 million new jobs related to such clean technologies. 
If we meet our Europe 2020 energy efficiency targets, we could create around 4.8 million new jobs through the direct and indirect impact of these measures. The jobs already created and the benefits ahead of us come about by seizing the opportunities which a more resource efficient economy presents. Often, these are very straightforward ideas, from detergents which work in cold water to more efficient shipping from smarter building codes to recycling precious metals. Our EU climate and energy policies with their clear targets did not only provide incentives to such developments, but gave Europe and its business a first mover advantage in many fields, not just in niche markets, but across the industrial chain. The clean fuel strategy, which the European Commission adopted earlier this month, is another example of how a European Union level approach adds value and unites fragmented national measures to create conditions for a new sector to flourish. The package, this package of measures will ensure the build-up of alternative fuel stations across Europe with common standards for their design and their use. By proposing a package of binding targets on member states for a minimum level of infrastructure, we hope to break the vicious circle of no demand for vehicles because there is no supply of fuel and no supply of fuel because there is no demand for vehicles. In this way, we hope to jumpstart the sector, creating new opportunities in Europe and potentially across the world. Ladies and gentlemen, these examples all demonstrate the advantages of our current European efforts. But there is also another lesson to be learned. All these examples required significant financial investment. This was made possible by confidence in the future direction of policy. Creating this climate of confidence, in turn, required a considerable political investment to look beyond day-to-day -day issues and have the courage and vision to develop a long-term strategy. The next essential challenge is clear. By 2030, global greenhouse gas emissions need to be reduced by 40% to be on the right track towards the agreed target to constrain atmospheric warming to 2 degrees Celsius. At the same time, it is also clear that we need to continue providing business with long-term regulatory predictability to boost and lock in low-carbon technologies. That is why the EU com the Commission is already strategically reflecting on the post-2020 horizon, both domestically and internationally. What types of climate and energy targets should we envisage? What are the best instruments to pursue them? And how would these, those interact with other, notably national instruments, from taxes to state aids to building codes? Secondly, how can we further improve the interplay between our climate objectives and the need to foster European competitiveness? Because let's face it, what underlies the current debt crisis in several European countries is at its heart a crisis of competitiveness. That is a key question in my view, because obviously our policy does not operate in an economic or political vacuum. To be clear again, I do not see energy and climate policy as contradictory to fostering Europe-wide competitiveness, but if done smartly, as mutually reinforcing. So we'll keep an eye on this dimension of competitiveness and of energy costs too. And thirdly, how should we take account of the international situation regarding a new global climate agreement? This is a moving target that we need to factor in too. The EU will continue to lead from the front in these talks, not from behind. But we need to stay realistic too. We only account for 11% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it would be wrong to assume that Europe alone could shoulder, shoulder all this burden. We want a new Green Deal on the global level, but one through which all emitters contribute their fair share. These are just a few of the strategic questions we are currently reflecting upon. But regardless of the concrete answers that the Commission will prepare in the course of this year, one thing is certain. We will plan and implement our response in very clear, close consultation, not just with our uh, European member states, with the regions, cities and communities of Europe, and of course with our global partners, but also with the business community and the civil society. Going for it together, that is the only way to deal with this challenge of a generation, 
And it is not enough to have good technocratic proposals. It is not enough to have good political agreements. We need the support of our uh, citizens. And to sum up, yes, the challenges we face are immense and they will possibly even become more complex in the future. A global consensus is essential among governments on all levels, but also, and above all, among peoples. I firmly believe that it is possible to achieve sustainability without shutting people out of development. On the contrary, this is an agenda for development and global growth. And energy plays an essential role in this and must be the heart of all our policies in the years to come. That is why we need to equip our European Union with the necessary tools. In just over a week, we expect the European Council to fix its position on the European Union's budget from 2014 to 2020. It means setting out the resources we'll have available to implement our policies for the next seven years. The European Commission has proposed that at least 20% of the resources available will be targeted on sustainability across all policy areas, from agriculture, via research, to foreign policy. We'll continue making the case in decisive talks for such a future-oriented budget that invests in the green drivers of growth. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I have so far resisted making any reference to the great cinema career of one of the next distinguished speakers. But let me conclude by saying, Governor Schwarzenegger, that this is not yet our last stand. <laughs> but we all need to be a little more like climate action heroes and do more individually and collectively to save our planet in Peru and to boost smart and inclusive sustainability. We, the European Union, will continue to do our share, and I'm certain that everyone here in this room and the people you represent will do the same. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>